You had just sat on the maquette for the golden tree. Oh. And I have to say that he was such a kind man. He forgave me, he even drove me home that night. He often reminded me of this solecism. Anyway, as I said, he was a wonderfully kind and obliging man, and he was a, he was a terrific host. He asked me often to firms, and I wish I'd gone more often there, because I'm a city boy. When you go to, when you went down to a beautiful farmhouse, he had, and he and Barbara had in Ferns, there were always things alien to me, like lots of horses dancing around, and uh, chickens and hens and cocks and fresh eggs and orchards. And best of all, really, um, oh, dogs. Because he always had loads of dogs. He had dogs like other people had mice, big as a dog. Yeah. And when, when I used to, when I used to stay there for my dinner, and he always made me these great dinners, and he was a terrific cook. I remember he made me some pheasant one night. The only time I've ever eaten any pheasant, and he had the, the correct accompanying drinks. And those drinks were so correct as I found out. It took me three days to recover. <laughs> <laughs> they were terrific. And then he would, he would. Uh, Put me in the spare room, and if it was cold, there'd always be a few dogs sleeping on the bed. And if it was extra cold, he'd knock on the door at two in the morning and say, Would you like a few more dogs on the bed? <laughs> you know, what can I say? He was just like one of the funniest guys in the world. Um, he was also completely impossible to avoid wherever you went. I, I kept seeing him. I remember I went to New York in 2005. He was in McSorley's saloon eating some bacon and cabbage and drinking because he couldn't get a full pint of drinking two half pints. And I looked up and there's a photograph of a charity grinning down at me. <laughs> and a couple of years later, in the Bistro Bulwark over in Paris, I, went, I can't remember. Dennis Bannister, another great architect, or just another great lecturer at any rate in, in Brooklyn Street. And we're down there, we're having a piche about the Vin Rouge some side of the matter so we look up and there is a photograph in fact it's a poster of him with some long forgotten traditional group there he is playing flute surrounded by guys playing the fiddle there's no escape better what a great guy now I have to tell you something about his work and I always admire his work I loved it I used to love it in the studio they showed me his drawings the drawings as I said have this bird this immediacy this he hasn't got time to be cross saturated. Don't tell me that. Here's a great picture. You look down here. Look how quick he's done this. Look how full of life it is. And here he is depicting himself with St. Francis of Assisi. A man whose lifestyle differed enormously from that of St. Francis of Assisi. <laughs> Nevertheless, like St. Francis, he could charm the birds out of the trees. You can see him doing that. And he, he, I loved how he could put people at their ease. I, God bless us, just a couple of weeks before he died, when he went into the Shelburne to accept that beautiful tribute from the foundry, the lovely bust they made him, uh, when he was very close to the end. Uh, I had a friend with me, a young lady from Kerry, who was a bit shy and found it difficult to talk to artists, but really wanted to talk to him, and he was sort of frightened of him. And I said, look, look, he's all right, just don't talk to him. And, and they spoke. And I went up and got the drinks, and when I came back, she was laughing. That was his power. He said, let's do that. He was such a charm. And of course, he was telling her all about how he knew her father, because her father was a singer. And obviously, he knew all the singers in Ireland. He knew everybody in Ireland. Uh, I, I want to end by saying that uh, John Updike, the novelist who had wanted to be a painter, and was a very considerable art critic, said something that seems to me to apply to Aim always, that artists take very little out of the world and they put so much into it. I can't think of anyone to whom that applies more logically than to Aim. And I'd like to finish completely by quoting uh, Mike Graham, who was the son of another very fine uh, architect, Sir Christopher Graham, who wrote an epitaph for his dad, which says in part, See, so Monu mentioned the queerest sort of speak out, which is to say, if you require a monument or you seek a monument, look around you. Ladies and gentlemen, if you seek anyone who died his monument, look around you. Thank you very much.